we have uh, with us, um, very pleased that she was able to um, join us today to offer her perspective on teaching, Sarah Hayden from the De uh, Department of Communication Studies. Um, she completed her PhD at University of Minnesota in 1994. Her research interests uh, include rhetorical theory, gender, feminism, and social movements. Um, she's published widely, uh, presented essays on the topics of uh, women's health, reproduction, sexuality, education, maternity, and the abortion debate in the United States. Her current work focuses on the rhetorical construction of maternity, and you'll see some of her articles out there, especially in the public sphere, uh, in sources like The Conversation, but also in a book, Mediated Moms, Contemporary Challenges to the Motherhood Myth. Um, the reason she's here, I always like to talk about our professors and what incredible researchers they are before I then pivot and say she's an amazing teacher as well. Um, she's won numerous teaching awards at the University uh, University of Montana's Distinguished Teaching Award in 2008. She was our nominee for the Professor of the Year, the Case United States Professor of the Year in 2013. Um, she won the Western States Communication Association Master Teacher Award in 2010. Uh, and then just this last spring, uh, she won the William Reynolds Award for Excellence in Teaching Across the Curriculum. Uh, this is a College of Humanities and Sciences Award. So please help me welcome Sarah Hayden. So I'm really short. Can you hear me? Is this good? Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Dean Kinch, and thank you all for having me here. Um, I'm really excited to give this short talk. I promise it will stay short. Um, when uh, Dean Kinch asked me to offer uh, some comments um, to this incoming group, it led me to reflect on my experiences when I was sitting where you're sitting, right? brand new graduate student, um, really excited about my graduate program. I love school, it's why I'm a professor. It's why you're here, right? You're good students, you love what it is you're going to be studying. Um, and, and so I was super excited about that. When I thought about teaching, I was terrified, right? And I was terrified kind of for the flip reason that I love school. I had been a student I had been a college student for five years. It took me five years to get my undergraduate degree. Um, and I was good at it, right? I knew how to read articles. I knew how to write papers. I knew how to take exams. I knew how to have a balanced life so that I could get my work done and still you know, go out and go hiking. I had no idea what it was like to be on the other side of the podium. And as a result, as I was sitting where you're sitting, I had a profound sense of imposter syndrome. I was sure that my students would know that I did not belong on the other side of the podium. And for me, that imposter syndrome was amplified by the fact that the first communication studies classroom I walked into was one I was going to be teaching. I had been a history and philosophy major as an undergrad, and the first comm class I walked into was a public speaking class. I had never taken public speaking. Okay, right, so I really thought that, you know, I was gonna be caught, terrified, as I said. Pretty quickly, though, I came to love it, and I still really love it. I've been at the University of Montana for 20 years, uh, 24 years, excuse me, um, and I was a teaching assistant for five years, so I've done it for a really long time. Um, I've come to love it, and I hope you do too, and what I wanna offer you today are just a couple of suggestions for making that transition, making that transition from being you know, this really excellent student to being an excellent teacher. So my first suggestion for you is that you approach being a teacher much like you approach being a student. No surprise, being a teacher and being a student are two sides of the same coin, right? And indeed, I think the other teachers in the room will tell you that the best way to learn something is to teach it, right? I learn things far more thoroughly when I teach them than if I'm you know, trying to absorb it in other ways. So what does that mean? What does it mean to approach being a teacher like you do being a student? For me, this means approaching my task with a sense of openness and curiosity. For me, it also means letting go of the assumption that I'm supposed to know everything, right? No one expects that you know everything about the field in which you are studying. No one expects 
public speaking teachers, I see, I see you sitting there. No one expects you know everything about the public sphere, right, about public speaking. And so you get to just let go of that assumption. Often, we learn things just a little bit before our students learn them, right? That's certainly true of being a teaching assistant. It's also true of being a seasoned professor. And that's because knowledge is constantly evolving. And so we're learning things and then we present it to our classes, right? Um, so I think for me, understanding that was really comforting. It sort of let me take a really deep breath and be okay with the fact that I am a good student, I do know how to learn, so do you, and I could do it. I could figure this out and I could figure out how to explain it to my students. A really important corollary to this is to learn to say three words. And those three words are, I don't know, right? Because your students are gonna be asking you questions and you aren't going to know the answer. They will. And when they ask you those questions about which you don't know the answer, the right response is, I don't know. Now, I usually precede that response with, wow, that's a really interesting question and what an interesting insight that will allude to, but I don't know. But here's how I, respond, how I follow that up. I follow it up by saying, I'll find out for you, right? And then go do that work. Go talk to your professors, look, in, you know, look, look it up um, in whatever resources you have, and the next day come back in class and, and, and fill them in. My point is don't fake it, um, because if you fake it, um, that's when you are being an imposter, right? And you're doing your students a real disservice because you're passing on fake news, as uh, uh, someone in our, in our um, world likes to say these days. Uh, and your students will eventually see through you, right, if you're, if you're just faking it. So um, again, remember that you're the teacher, but you're also the participant in the learning process. And that's why we're all here. That's why we're all in um, academia, right? We love it. It's so, so just think of it as part of that learning process. My second suggestion for you, um, and in my second suggestion, I'm going to be talking to you not as teaching assistants, but instead as graduate students. And what I want to um, impress upon you is that it's really important to remember that you are graduate students first. Your first job is to succeed at your graduate program. And what that means is that you're going to need to learn to balance your teaching responsibilities and your own graduate student responsibilities. Here's the catch. Teaching can absorb as much time as you let it, right? Um, Furthermore, as, what may, as opposed to what might, may seem like you know, really far off deadlines, oh, I have to write that paper at the end of the semester for my class, or I have to come up with a topic for my thesis or dissertation, or I have to do that research, that's all way far away. But tomorrow, you've got to prepare a lesson plan, right? And for tomorrow, you have to grade your students' papers. And it's really easy to spend hours searching on YouTube for that perfect video that's going to illustrate the point that you want to make most well, right? It's really easy to spend hours parsing a student's paper, giving them all of the specific feedback um, that, you, that you can give them because you care about your students. Now, don't get me wrong. It's great to look for those good videos on YouTube to illustrate your point. And it's important to offer your students serious and significant feedback. But we have to learn how to balance this. And so we need to seek out ways to be efficient. Um, and I think each discipline, uh, those means to efficiency will be unique. And so I'm not going to try to offer um, tips for efficiency. But what I am going to offer is a suggestion that you talk to others in your field, right? Talk to your professors. Talk to more seasoned GTAs who have done it for a while. Um, ask them how they're able to get all of this stuff done and still have time to put most of their energies into being a student. Um, the other thing that I would suggest is that you share your resources, right? Um, if you found a really great YouTube video, share it with your colleague down the hall. Um, and then hopefully they'll share with you too. That way you don't have to worry so much about, you know, um, doing everything on your own. Your um, cohort, your graduate student cohort is a really good resource for you. In addition to uh, sort of thinking about setting those boundaries, 
uh, I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me, in addition to figuring out how to balance teaching and um, uh, your own teaching and your own schoolwork, you also need to learn about setting boundaries. And here again, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my own experiences. Uh, when I first got to the University of Montana, I would put my um, personal phone number on my syllabi. And in doing that, I was modeling a professor for my own undergraduate career. I loved this professor. I thought she was amazing. Um, I remember specifically as an undergraduate, sitting in the student union, working with a group of other students on a paper assignment that was due for her the following week. And we were really struggling. And she had given us her home phone number Saturday afternoon. So we called her, right? Not only did she answer the phone, she came to the union to help us, right? At the time, I thought she was amazing, right? With numerous years of teaching under my belt, I think that was inappropriate. Not that she wasn't trying to do the, wrong, the right thing, but she wasn't holding those boundaries solid. Um, holding those boundaries solid is part of what you're teaching your students to. Um, teaching them about being a professional, teaching them about what your role is and about what their role is. Um, as um, Chief uh, Ludeman said, we're not our students' friends. We might really enjoy our students, but we're not their best buddies. And so, you know, answering the phone at all hours of the evening, which I did when I put my personal phone number on uh, my syllabus, is really not appropriate. Um, and also, I, I don't know about you, I did my undergraduate in, um, uh, at the University of, or my graduate work at the University of Minnesota, and that was a, it's a, you know, it's in um, Minneapolis-St. Paul area, so it's a, it's a big um, metropolitan area. Um, and you would, you know, it was easy to avoid your professors uh, when you were out on the town. But in Missoula, that's not gonna be the case. So you're gonna be at the grocery store and you're gonna run into your students. You're gonna be at the gym, right? And you're gonna run into your students. And it's really not appropriate if they think that's the right time to say, hey, Dr. Hayden, how did I do on my exam? And I've had that happen, right? Again, I had that happen when I wasn't good about sort of marking those boundaries. So um, again, I don't list my phone number on my syllabus anymore. Um, and I suggest that you don't do that either. Um, I'm very responsive to email. Uh, I will usually respond to email within 24 hours, um, but I don't do it at three in the morning because I'm sleeping, even though my students aren't. Um, and, and again, sort of, I've, I've really learned to establish these boundaries, and I think it's, I think it's an important um, lesson that I learned that I would, I would offer to you as well. My third point is, so these two points have been pretty big. My third point is gonna be much more narrow and reflects one of my own pet peeves. Um, and it has to do with emails. Um, check your email often. This is the official way that the university requests we um, uh, interact, we communicate with our students. When you are writing emails, keep in mind that your emails are an official public record. I'm not gonna get into the legalities of it. I have a feeling that you're gonna hear about that later in the day. Um, but what I do wanna to suggest to you is that as an official public document, you want to write your emails well. This is not a text to your friend asking to meet up at, you know, go to this movie with you. Um, so use good grammar, use appropriate punctuation, make sure that your spelling is accurate. Again, this is part of what we do. We're modeling to our students professional behavior. And, um, that those email messages can seem irrelevant, but I, again, and it is my pet peeve, so thank you for um, uh, uh, bearing with me on this, but I, but I think it's really important that we, we do it in that, in that vein. Okay, my fourth suggestion, and I think um, Mike may, may have spoken a little bit about, uh, about this in the earlier session, is that it's really important not to make assumptions about what is going on with our students. Some of our students are gonna be fabulous. They're gonna be like you were, right? They're gonna love the subject. They're gonna be engaged. They're gonna have done all of the homework and the readings. They're gonna be talkative in class. Others are gonna be, look bored. They're gonna seem hostile. They're going to be disengaged, right? Remember that students have very complicated lives. Um, they get tired, they get busy, they get depressed, they get preoccupied. And so if one of your students seems to be disengaged, not showing up to classes, um, follow up, right? Follow up respectfully. Give them a chance. Reach out. 
remain approachable, keep a sense of humor. But if they don't respond to your overtures, don't take it personally. Don't worry about it, um, as long as they're not interfering with other students' learning. If they are interfering with other students' learning, then you do need to take more serious um, action, and I'm sure, again, each department will have rules for that, um, uh, policies for that. But if they're not in, uh, engaged, you know, interfering with someone else's um, learning, and they just seem out of it to you, and you've reached out and they're not responding, don't take it personally. It's really easy to fixate, to focus on those students who seem angry at you, right? Those students who somehow don't seem to like you. Um, don't do it. They don't deserve your energy. A long time ago, I learned um, my mantra, which is to focus on the good ones. And by the good ones, I don't necessarily mean the brightest ones, right? I don't necessarily mean um, the best performers, although maybe they're the brightest students in your class and maybe they're the best performers. But really, the good ones are the ones who, again, are engaged, who seem to really want to be there, who are um, interested in learning the material. Those are the people who deserve your energy. And so, again, students who are um, disengaged, I will follow up respectfully, but I to put as little of my energy there, um, my emotional energy in particular, as, um, as I can, and I put most of my energy on those students in the classroom who, who want to be there, who want to, ha to learn something from me. My fifth and last suggestion um, is that you keep experimenting and keep learning. There are always new ways to approach topics. There are always new strategies that one can utilize to promote critical thinking, to um, help your students learn. One of the best ways to uh, discover some of these uh, new resources is to talk to your peers, talk to your teachers, observe others teaching. Um, we do it in our uh, program as a matter of course. Um, professors observe other professors' classes, and we ask one another for feedback about how we did, you know, what was going well, what didn't seem to work. It's really nice to get a peer um, uh, take on that. Um, and it's also really a wonderful learning experience for me to sit in on my colleagues' classes and to see, oh, that's a really neat technique that they're using that I hadn't thought of. So I'm going to steal that, right? You don't steal exercises, but you can steal approaches. Um, so talk with one another, observe, um, uh, uh, ask for feedback, give feedback, um, and have fun. It really is, teaching is a really wonderful opportunity. Um, it's a, a as my first point was, teaching itself is a wonderful learning experience, a learning opportunity, and that's really what we're here for. So um, good luck, have fun, and that's what I have for, to offer for you today. Thank you. Did you answer a question if I want one? Yeah, no, lots of questions. We do have a, a minute or two. If anyone has a question for Sarah, uh, yeah. Did you say like Facebook or something? Yeah, like Facebook. Um, yeah, that's a that's a good question. I think so. We have Moodle, right? And Moodle often op offers an opportunity to hold sort of discussions, course discussions, and I think that would be appropriate. But for example, I. Um, and maybe setting up a Facebook page for the course, a closed Facebook page, um, but I would be really careful to keep it professional, right? I don't friend my students on Facebook until after they graduate. Yeah. 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 Any other quick questions? 